Let's create that deadlock in Java. I, I kind of feel like, 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 you know, there are no good guys in this one. Wrap your object with the ref cell and then borrow that mutably twice. If you're going to do something stupid, make it really stupid. Yeah, and go all in. <laughs> yeah. Did you know that the iPhone has an integrated circuit that runs Java? iOS uses it to store your Apple Pay account numbers. In contrast to that, Big Tech is adapting Rust, including traditional Java users like Amazon. In this article title, Why AWS Loves Rust and How We Will Like to Help, Shane Miller, Senior Software Engineering Manager at AWS, says. Rust helps us deliver fast, robust services to AWS customers at Amazon scale. Most MasterCard and Visa Plastics have SIM cards that run Java under the hood. I thought SIM cards were like dumb devices, similarly to magnetic stripes, but nope. These are full-fledged mini computers. So which language is better? Is it fair comparing Java, which came out in 1996 with Rust? Maybe we should just speedrun this and compare Kotlin with Rust. I mean, Rust Stable was released in 2015. I am doing this because you, my dear subscribers, requested it. Handy, here you go, my friend. This is going to be awesome, friends. I promise. I'm truly tired of superficial hot takes on Java with 0% depth. Java is going to go straight in the trash tier. I mean, I get it. People hate the boilerplate. Probably static void main, right? But I really want to go deeper than anyone else on this topic. And probably that's not that hard. Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to be conducting right. a speed test between Java and Rust. No, please. Don't tell me you're going to create a while loop. Ah, uh, yeah, you created a while loop. Screw it. <laughs> Objectively, Java succeeded at its primary directive, I guess. Write once, debug everywhere, or something like that. And today, we will leave all the memes aside and evaluate both languages in an unbiased way. Yeah, sure. We will focus on the following topics. Language goals, licensing, security, memory management, compilation, syntax, concurrency, and tooling. At the end of the video, I'll create a simple web server using the most mainstream libraries to compare memory and CPU usage so that we know how much money we'll have to give AWS or GCP to get started. All right, so let's jump right into it. I prepared this cheat sheet so that you can follow along. It's in the description. So let's start with the less controversial stuff. Memory safety and security. These are two shared goals of both products. And you will think this is something common to all programming languages, but it's not. If you use Node or Python, these two languages are not memory safe. Also C, well, it's infamous for not being memory safe. Portability. Both languages want to be portable. Java achieves that by compiling once into their bytecode, while in Rust, you can define different targets for different architectures. So you do compile once per architecture. And when we get to compilation, we'll uh, dive into the details here. The next area I want to focus on is uh, Java's simple, object-oriented, and familiar approach to uh, programming. Uh, so this language was designed so that C and C++ programmer could pick it up really fast. Uh, it is interpreted, as we discussed, because it's compiled into bytecode that then is executed using a just-in-time compiler. We'll dive into that a little bit later. It's threaded and dynamic. A Rust is all about expressiveness, efficiency, and performance. So again, the goal is to replace C and C++. And this uh, part about expressiveness, to me, it comes from like the functional programming side of things. So you'll notice like a very powerful and elegant type system that we get with Rust. You might be asking yourself, why are you talking about licensing? Like, let's dive into the code and all that, but... Guys, uh, Java is owned by Oracle. And Oracle is a infamous company in terms of litigation. You can look up online like all the litigation against Google going on with Android. You know, when it comes to this case, I, I, I kind of feel like, 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 you know, there are no good guys in this one. I wanted to get this out of the way immediately like is it possible to use java without having oracle breathing uh, over your neck and yes the answer is yes so you can use the open jdk it's supported by red hat and with regards to rust well most rust projects are apache or mit licensed so now let's talk a little bit about rust security there's a public repository in GitHub with all the known vulnerabilities in the language. 
and as a Rust developer, I appreciate this because I can look at what the problem is and also see how they fixed it. The Rust sec team put out a tool so that you can scan your dependencies. Let's install Cargo Audit to check for vulnerabilities. Now let's run Cargo Audit. We see that the tool detected an overflow vol in the base64 crate. We can follow the link to learn what this vulnerability is all about. Keep in mind that this tool relies on human reports which are kept in a database. The tool won't run any code analysis, it just queries a database. So as you know, Java has a garbage collector. This means that when you instantiate an object, you get a reference to it. You can copy that reference and pass it around. And when that reference count goes down to zero, the Java runtime will deallocate the objects. Uh, this is not perfect. Um, sometimes what happens is developers hold on to uh, references to objects for too long. So that means that some objects never get deallocated. What you'll see is that you pile all these references for a very long time, and then your program will just become slow. And then there are all these profiling tools that help you visualize what's holding onto these objects so that you can like nullify those references and gain some memory back. With regards to Rust, there's this myth online where basically they say that in Rust, you need to manage the memory manually. I, I will say this is mostly false. The borrow checker is a static analysis tool that ensures safe and correct use of memory. It works by checking that references to data are valid and that data is not borrowed mutably while it is also borrowed immutably. Developers still need to think carefully about the lifetime of values. And what does this mean? Well, it turns out that you can define the lifetime of static, and static means that uh, these objects are expected to be around for the duration of the, of the application. Those are leaks. But trust me, the borrow checker is your best friend. Now, we'll try to create some memory errors with both Rust and Java and see what happens. Okay, let's try to create that dangling pointer using Java. First, we'll use an array list and we'll stuff this array list with a bunch of numbers. Then we'll copy the, the what may, <laughs> if we are successful, we'll actually cause a dangling pointer, but for, it's, it, it, right now it's just a variable name. So we'll assign dangling pointer to dangling pointer copy, then nullify a dangling pointer and here's the in interesting part. Do you think that making this reference to an object will cause the object to be deallocated or not? Well, we'll find out. So if it makes the object null, then technically dangling pointer copy should become null as well. So let's find out. <laughs> Sweet. So we see that the object is not null. Java keeps track of the uh, reference count. And because we copied the reference here, the, the reference, reference count became one. It became two in this case, because there were two references to the same object, and then it became one here. So pretty cool. All right, let's try to do the same thing in Rust. So first we'll declare our vector with three elements, then we'll try to drop it, which is the equivalent of nullifying the reference in, in Java and then we'll try to use it. So let's run this and see what happens. All right, so what we see is that the compiler says that we are trying, like when we try to drop the, the object, uh, we, move, we are moving the dangling pointer into the drop function. So nothing else can use it after that. And we here we see that we are trying to use a, a, a value that has been moved. So we could not cause a dangling pointer on Java Rust. Let me know in the comments if there's a way to do it. Let me try to show you a null pointer in Java. And actually, this was a pleasant surprise for me because it used to be the case that you could compile code like this where string A is obviously null. You will try to call a method on it. And obviously this will cause a runtime exception. This no longer compiles. And you know what? That's a good thing. Good for Java. <laughs> It's just not possible to create null pointer errors in Rust because we don't have null pointers. So there are multiple ways to create memory issues in Rust. The easiest one is to wrap your object with the ref cell and then borrow that mutably twice. And because ref cell allows you to do the borrow checker uh, validation at runtime, then it, the program will just crash. 
Another way is to uh, define an unsafe block on code and do some crazy stuff inside of it. Java generates bytecode. Bytecode is executed by the Java Virtual Machine, which is mostly a platform-independent execution environment. Rust generates native machine code that can be run on the target platform. It uses LLVM as a compiler backend, just like Swift. Do you know what will be like really dumb but fun if I just switched keywords? So I just switched to these keywords. Um, hopefully I can complete the video, we'll see. <laughs> so let's plug it up and see what happens. If you're gonna do something stupid, make it really stupid. Yeah. All right, this is uh, an absolute mistake. It will slow me down, but it should be fun. You know, something new, I guess. Both languages allow you to create multi-threaded applications using real OS threads as opposed to the fake threads that you get with Python. But be aware, you can cause deadlocks. Let's create a deadlock in Java. For this, we'll need two locks. So, two locks and two threads. And we're, what we're going to do is we will acquire two locks within the th first thread. So lock one and within that lock, without giving it back, we'll acquire lock two. So the order is lock one, lock two. To cause a deadlock, what we're going to do is on the second thread, we'll try to acquire lock two first, and that should just cause the, the program to deadlock. So it will stop making progress. All right. And then we need to start the threads. And this should do it. Let's see. So here, what we see is that both threads start and acquire the first lock. So we see that lock, like thread one acquires lock one. And then thread two acquires lock two, and then they stop making progress. So be, watch out, the IDE, Java won't help you with this. Now we'll build the same exact program, but uh, using Rust. So let's go ahead and create the locks. Then uh, you might be asking like, why do you copy these? Because uh, due to the ownership model in Rust, we're going to pass lock one and lock two to the first th thread and lock one clone and lock to clone to the second thread. We'll spawn the thread, acquire lock one, then just sit there for a second and attempt to uh, acquire lock two and we're done. And on thread two, we'll do the same thing. We'll just swap the order of the locks. And then we need to start our threads. Well, actually you start the thread as soon as you get to this line but then you need to wait for the thread to uh, finish, basically. So let's run this and see if it does the thing. And sure enough, we accomplished the deadlock that we were looking for. So yep, no guard royals on Rusty there. So be careful out there. Because of these issues, I recommend that you explore alternative parallel programming paradigms like message passing. This should make all the Go programmers out there super happy since they use coroutines for this. So here we have the same program made in Java and Rust, same goal. So the idea is to exchange messages, to pass messages between different threads. So we'll create five producer threads and five consumers, and then each producer will send one message. And then, so if you have five producers, then five messages, and then the consumer threads will consume exactly one message per consumer and then just die is same it's the same program on both languages and there are some a few things i want to point out so in case of java we have this built-in class called concurrent link view in case of rust we don't have that but we have a beautiful a third-party library called crossbeam that provides that so uh, look at how in Rust you, we get a sender object and a receiver object, while in Java we just get a reference to the to the queue. And then it's a little bit uh, mysterious, like how you pass the queue to the different threads. Uh, it's just thread safe, and that's the end of it. In 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 Rust we do have to clone the like the sender end of the of the channel into each of the threads. Obviously, if I 
delete this, I'm going to get some sort of like a borrow error because yeah, of course, I cannot move the same sender to multiple to multiple uh, threads. I need to clone it. Um, so that's something to be aware of. Um, I gets cloned uh, automatically uh, in the case of Rust. Surprisingly, and it does make sense actually, but surprisingly in, in case of, of Java, if I like, you need to make a I, like whatever you pass to the thread needs to be final. If you try to pass an object that can be mutated outside of the thread, it really gets angry. But only for primitives, not for references. So that's very interesting. That's uh, uh, like a different rule for objects than references there. So we start the thread, we send a single message to, to, to the queue, and then we, then we wait for the thread to end. Then uh, we start, we create a collection to store the, uh, the, thre the consumer threads. That's in case of, of uh, Java, in case of Rust. What we store in the collection are the handles to the to the threads, and uh, we start the threads. And here, check, take a look at this. Here we pull for messages. That means that this is a non-blocking operation. You're just going to look if there's a new object, and if there isn't a new object, it will just keep going. If there's no new object, you'll just put a null pointer there. In case of Frost, it's a little bit different. The receive is a blocking operation and if the sender end is closed then this will raise an error a receive error which i think it's more expressive that also goes for the producer side when you queue up a new message you just get a boolean back with this. so if true that means that you successfully queued up the message else this gets you a, a, a false but that doesn't tell you what happened. Instead, in Rust, you do get to know what the error is, which I think it's just ex it speaks about the, how expressive Rust is. And uh, then just wait for all the threads to finish. So you just wait, and if there's an error, you can just the way to get the error here will be right. So that's that's a way to get the error without using un unwrap. For production code, never use unwrap because else, it, you know, the whole application will just panic all over. In, in the case of Java, we'll just you just get an exception, and this will make the whole ap application throw. Wrap the handle join with a try catch, and you can you can handle the error right there. So, what do you think? I believe that both are very similar, but I like Rust better because of the expressive type system and the safety. <laughs> Also, if your program is network bound, meaning you spend most of the time making network requests or writing to a database, I recommend that you explore using Rust asynchronous programming using Tokyo Framework. Let me know in the comments if you would like me to talk about asynchronous programming. One particular area where I would like to focus is tooling. So a great language requires great tooling so that you can be productive as a developer. In case of Java, the tooling is very mature. So there's this tool called SDK uh, Man that can help you to manage your uh, Java uh, JDK version. You can see that there are many JDKs out there. I believe that Correto is managed by Amazon. Yeah, it's definitely managed by Amazon. And then, so knock yourself out. There are many options out there. There's even the Oracle JDK if you really want it. If we want to install a particular version of the SDK, we just use the identifier that we got from the list and bam let's leave that working and let's switch to rust so in rust we have a, a tool called rust app used to manage our tool chain and then we can use um rust app to install a particular version of, of rust and it installs not only the uh, compiler, but uh, all the tools that you need. In this case, Clippy is extremely used to lint your code, a FMT Rust format to format it, and so on and so forth. So very convenient. Yeah, yeah, sure, I want that to be the default. 
that's awesome. You can also use SDK man to install Gradle. Gradle is like this tool used in Java for managing your build and your dependencies. So very, very useful. So you can do SDK install Gradle. And in this case, I, it's already installed, but you can install any version that you want, which is super handy. Then when you want to create a project, you can just use Gradle in it. And it's like a little wizard so that you can decide if you want to create like a Java application. Yeah, I want to use Java. No, just one application. I want to use Groovy. Testing framework. Er, yeah, you get like a hello world structure of a Java project, which is pretty, pretty useful, in my opinion. In Rust, we have a similar way to create a project straight from the terminal. So what you need to do is use cargo. So you get like a slightly simpler project, but uh, with almost the same kind of functionality. You have your cargo where you define your dependencies and so on, and then a main file. So yeah, pretty straightforward. This is not a benchmark, but I wanted to see how much memory and CPU time will a Hello World in Spring Boot will take versus a Hello World in Actix Web. So these are like the two most mainstream web servers on each language. So first, let's take a look at Java. So the server is already running. And if we pull the browser, we just get like the, you know, the tremendous uh, hello world. And then this is the process. So we see that really, I mean, Spring Boot is just sitting there. It's not doing any work. And if we, if we just hit that handle, I know it's not going to hit a database or do anything fancy, but still, I want to see what happens if we just hit it. Like, what am I trying to test here? If you are starting on a project Greenfield and you want to play with the, uh, you know, with uh, Spring Boot on a EC2 instance, how much will this cost you? That that's the only answer I'm trying to provide here, and the answer is that you don't actually need much, uh, which is refreshing. So this is the this is the process, and it's using a hundred megabytes. It's fine. Uh, let's try uh, with. Uh, Rust, I mean. All right, so same thing, hello world. And in terms of the memory and CPU usage, we just need to look for this. Okay, so this uses a fraction of the memory. So you just use like 2.5 megabytes. This is not doing anything, just hello world handle, you know, but you know. Um, and uh, you know, in terms of CPU, uh, Rust obviously uses less CPU and less memory. Uh, is it significant? I wouldn't just pick one language over the other just of because of this, because I think like the smallest EC2 instance these days has like either one or two gigabytes of memory. So, you know, for practical purposes for a service, my opinion, I will just use Actix because it uses a little bit less memory, but it's not a showstopper, you know, you use Java. Anyways, I hope this is helpful, you know, you can go spin like a micro instance and both Java and Rust will work. We answer that. All in all, to me, these are two excellent programming languages. In my opinion, many of the complaints about Java being too verbose are addressed on Java 19. So. Uh, I found it very refreshing to see that the compiler infers the types that you're trying to use and you just use var, like if you were using uh, Node or, or Rust. Um, the tooling is very decent. You can see that Amazon is putting millions of dollars behind Java. Rust goes without saying, is, is, in my opinion, is, is, is just superior. If you require the performance of running native compile code, just use Rust, it's a not-brainer. Another thing that I didn't mention is it's possible to write full-stack WebAssembly applications with Rust. So I provided a free, um, so I provided a template if you want to use it. To the best of my knowledge, it's not possible to do this with, um, with Java. So that's another data point, you know.
my recommendation is to never become a fanboy of anything. Rust is a very useful tool, but it's not a cult or a religion, so just keep that in mind. So with that, thank you very much. See you next time.